we have taken a break from John uh, for a couple weeks because we're going through our Advent um, weeks, and this week is the, the week of hope. And so if you'll turn uh, in your Bibles, not you turn in your Bibles, but if you will take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah, we're going to be in the Old Testament today. Isaiah 64. Isaiah is known as the weeping prophet because he, uh, he experienced a lot of sadness that Jerusalem and Israel had to go through. And he was the one that would cry out to them and tell them, hey, get your act together, <laughs> Israel. You're, you're far from God and you need to get your act together. So we're going to read Psalm 60, or Isaiah 64, verses 1 through 9. It's going to kind of seem out of place because this is hope today, correct? So this is going to kind of feel a little bit like this. How does this scripture go along with hope? But Isaiah 64 is truly about hope. And that's where we're going to see today. Verse 1 says, Isaiah is writing this. He says, Oh, that you would burst from the heavens and come down. How the mountains would quake in your presence. As fire causes wood to burn and water to boil, your coming would make the nations tremble. Then your enemies would learn the reason for your fame. When you came down long ago, you did awesome deeds beyond our highest expectations. And oh, how the mountains quaked. For since the world began, no ear has heard, no eye has seen a God like you, who works for those who wait for Him. You welcome those who gladly do good, who follow godly ways. But you have been very angry with us, for we are not godly. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. And no one calls on your name or pleads with you for mercy. Therefore, you have turned from us and turned, from, turned us over to our sins. And yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We all are formed by your hand. Don't be so angry with us, Lord. Please don't remember our sins forever. Look at us, we pray, and see that we are all your people. Father, we thank you for this scripture today. We ask that you would help us as we understand what it means for us today, as we look forward in hope to your coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This year has kind of flown by in some ways and other ways. It's kind of dragged along, but today we're beginning our Advent series that's called Let Earth Receive Her King, and it's taken from the lyrics of the song Joy to the World. So what is Advent? Advent is a season in the life of the church where we take each week leading up to Christmas and we prepare our hearts in anticipation, not only for the celebrating of, of God coming to earth in the form of, of a baby in a manger, but we are anticipating the return of our Middle Eastern friend, Jesus, our Savior, when he returns in power and glory to set things right once and for all. And we should all say amen to that, right? Don't you feel kind of in that spot where evil wins? Wickedness wins right now. It feels like it kind of covers us, and it's, not, it's nice to think of hope that we have. We remember Jesus' challenge to us before ascending into heaven. In, in Matthew, it talks about the Great Commission. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching those disciples to obey my commands, to love God with all that you, you are, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus told his disciples in John 14, that he was going to prepare a place for his followers, and then when he was ready, he would come back and get us so that we could be with him forever. And the meaning of Advent, Advent literally means the anticipation of, or the arrival of, of an anticipation of a person, place, or thing. And each week, week as we lead up to Christmas, we have a different theme. So today is hope. This is our, our theme for this week. And I don't know about you, but as I look at the state of our world and the evil and the hate and the injustice that there seems to be in the world all around us, it's even hard for us sometimes to even muster up hope. It just feels like it weighs, everything weighs us down. But that is exactly the meaning of hope. 
in order for there to be a need for hope, things have to look hopeless. You think about what we've just been through in John with Lazarus and, and Mary and Martha, and their, their hearts were broken because Lazarus had died, and they were in the middle of hopelessness. Both Mary and Martha, had they saw no way out. And in a hopeless situation, in walks Jesus of Nazareth into Bethany and does something incredible and blows their minds. So in order for there to be a need for hope there, has, the hope, there has to be a stirring of hope. Situations have to look bleak. I mean, this week we watched It's a Wonderful Life on Thanksgiving night, and all, I'm fa- proud of my family. They all stayed awake for it, except for Andrea. They actually made, my mom actually made it through the entire movie. She said, I can't believe that I've seen this. I've never seen that movie before all the way. No one would sign up to watch the Christmas movie It's a Wonderful Life if there wasn't a hopeless situation for George Bailey to find himself in. Where is the anticipation for good things to happen? Let me remind us, as I have to remind myself very often, that it is when there seems to be no hope that God does his best work. When, when the good guys seem to have lost, the unexpected character that you thought was already out comes in and saves the day. <laughs> you know, that's how it always happens. It's that unexpected person that you thought was out and they were done for. And then all of a sudden, the last minute, the gun's over there and the, guys, the good guys can't get to his gun. And then whack in the back of the head, the bad guys go and then the guy gets his gun and takes him into captivity. And the good guy wins in the end. That is what hope looks like. And sometimes I find myself wondering how to respond in situations in my life where I have lost all hope, when I have gotten to the place where it's even hard to muster up hope in my life. And I imagine that we all find ourselves in that situation of hopelessness sometimes. Because sometimes we allow ourselves to focus on the temporary, forgetting that we have a God that specializes in the impossible. Judy, you have a a hope that Roy will be healed. But if he's not, guess what? Do you have a hope that you're going to see him again someday? We all have those moments of frustration like Mary and Martha had when Lazarus died. But, but when we enter into our text today in, in Isaiah 64, Isaiah 64 takes us into, and I want to give you the context of where we are in Isaiah because I don't know, most people probably don't study Isaiah but as Isaiah is in, in, ver, in chapter 64, 1 through 9, he's talking about about 700 years before Jesus comes to earth, before Christ even comes. Isaiah was living in a desperate time. The nation of Israel was literally divided in two, north and the south, divided in, completely divided in two. Up north, uh, there was another northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and up north, above the northern kingdom, there was of Israel, there was a superpower called Assyria. The king that ruled Assyria was named Sennacherib. Now, the only reason I remember that is because it sounds like a rack of ribs. That's the only way. I, that's that's the only way that I'm remembering that guy's name. Sennacherib, a rack of ribs. So that's it. Whatever it takes, absolutely. I remember Potiphar, and my mom doesn't remember this when she would teach us in Bible classes and stories. Potiphar, uh, the guy, the the Egyptian ruler, Potiphar, she took a pot, a pan, and she took one of my little uh, Daniel Boone coonskin hats and put it in the pot. I know you don't remember this. And that's how I remembered Potiphar. Potiphar. It's just me. Just ignore it. It's okay. Sennacherib, he was a ruthless savage, and he had already conquered the northern kingdom and had destroyed almost all of the southern kingdom where Jerusalem was located. The people of Israel who were returning home after being in exile by Babylon for decades, these people had been away from their home, separated from their families, separated from the people that they loved. All of them had been scattered out for decades. And when they walked back in to Israel, they expect to find their family, they expect to find their houses, they expect to find the temple, and and just like they left it. But when they walk into Jerusalem, when they walk into Israel, it is a desolate wasteland, and there is nothing there growing. There is no buildings. There's no nothing. 
this wicked king from Assyria had just destroyed every single thing. They wanted to make Israel feel like that they were slaves in Egypt all over again. They absolutely had nothing. For years, they had told their children and grandchildren about the home that they once had, that God had given their ancestors this promised land that they would have, and they, they think they're going to walk into the good old days. Back at home. Imagine your entire life, everything that you've worked for, completely gone, completely disintegrated, everything that you had. Churches, synagogues, buildings, all of your homes, your family's homes, your, your cattle, your livestock, everything completely gone. For years, their children and grandchildren had heard about the land that God had promised them and how they would walk into this place unrecognizable now. And Isaiah records the sorrow that they felt in this lament of Isaiah 64. Oh, that you would burst from the heavens and come down. You, you, you feel the cry in his voice as he is he's begging God to rip open heaven and show himself. I mean, don't you ever, you, you ever feel that way? Like when, when evil is so pronounced and prevalent? When there's so much wickedness that happens, I think of the children, the thou, hundreds of thousands of children that are abused every year, every day, that are sold into sex trafficking and sex slavery. I think of the babies that are aborted. I think of those, those innocent lives that are just, just decimated. And I want to be like, God, will you please rip open heaven and just, wouldn't it be awesome if God just showed up right in the middle of that and just disintegrated every one of those evil people? It's one of those prayers that I'm just like, God, come on. Just do it. Just, just rip open heaven and show yourself who you are. It is. But Isaiah writes, Oh, that you would burst from the heavens and come down. How the mountains would quake in your presence. As fire causes wood to burn and water to boil, your coming would make the nations tremble. Then your enemies would learn the reason for your fame. You see, the people of Israel were wondering where God is. They think that they've been abandoned by God and, and they want to know why God would leave them like this. I read a story this week about a, a man and his son who were in Toys R Us, and it was Christmas season, and they were, he was returning something to the front desk, and his little boy got away from him, and he was like six, maybe six years old. Little kid didn't know where he was going. He's gone. The dad looks down, and the boy's gone. It, we've been in those panic situations before, haven't we, Andrea? Addie's hiding in the clothes rack, remember? And you're like panicking, where is she? And Addie's just hiding in the middle of the clothes rack, freaking Andrea out. This little boy's gone in Toys R Us. There's, I mean, it's packed, all these Christmas shoppers. And the dad is there at the front door, so he, he can see the front doors and realizes that, the, that his son has not gone out the doors. He's in the store somewhere. So what he does is he goes into the security office, and he gets the manager, and he says, do you have security systems that I can look at? And the, the, the man says, yeah. That, we, he said, I'm trying to find my son that's lost. And he says he's looking, he scans all of the different televisions, the different zones, and he finds his son in the middle of an aisle, crying and he says to the manager he says do you have an intercom system that i could use and and the man gives him the intercom systems dial, dials it in so all the speakers all over the store and he says the little boy's name and the little boy stops crying and he looks up and he hears his father's voice and he looks around thinking that his father is all around him because he hears the voice all around him and the father says son this is your dad I want you to stay where you are. I see you, but you can't see me. Stay where you are. I'm coming to you. Do not move. Stay where you are. And the father describes the excitement that his son had when he finally saw his father coming down the aisle directly to where he was. I think that's where Israel is in this moment. They feel abandoned by God. They... They are literally begging God to come down and make the nations tremble to prove that to the enemies who God is, the fame that God has. And it says in verse 3, he says, 
Isaiah is saying, when you came down long ago, you did awesome deeds beyond our highest expectations. And oh, oh, how the mountains quaked. For since the world began, no ear has heard, no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. You welcome those who gladly do good, who follow godly ways. Now these people remember the ways that God had interceded in the past, and they wonder where God is in this time. They've heard uh, their, their, their entire lives, the miraculous stories surrounding Abraham and Moses and how God had established their nation freed the people from slavery in Egypt and led them through the Red Sea. I mean, that picture alone you could imagine. They're seeing this God that can do anything, that can stop an army of vicious people coming after them. But I want you to see something. In verse 5, their cries of sadness and lament, they don't stay in the lament stage for very long. It turns into a confession. Verse 5, the second part of verse 5 says this, But you have been very angry with us, for we are not godly. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? It's gone from, God, where are you? Why aren't you helping? To, we're confessing now what we, have, what the, we are not living up to what we should be living up to. We're constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? Verse 6, he writes, We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. I want you to catch what's happening. In the middle of crying out to God, something happens. They begin to realize that it isn't God who left them. Okay? It isn't God who walked away from them. It's them that have drifted away, that have turned their back on God. They instantly realize that it is their sin that has separated them from God. They confess that any righteous deeds that they have are like filthy rags in the light of their sin. Now I want to point out something that might not be very obvious to you, they are confessing as a community, not as individuals. This is not an individual saying, I'm sinning. This is us saying, hey, we have sinned. We realize we have sinned. Don't you wish that we as a nation would do that? I really think that God would hear us if we confessed and said, God, it's us who have not stood up for what is right. It is not who, it's us who have not stood up and are let our voices be known when we should have stood up and said, wrong is wrong. Now, some of us might have done that, but a lot of times we keep that to ourselves and we say, man, this just isn't going the way it should go. And then we keep our voices quiet and we don't say anything and we don't stand up for what is right. They are, they are confessing, their confession is about who they have been as a nation. I mean, we could do that. Imagine... In America, we think about this last week, we celebrated the pilgrims that came to America for religious liberty, for relig religious freedom. And we're still fighting that battle. This is about their corporate sin as a group. This is about the way they as a society, as a people, have forsaken God. This is them as a nation owning the fact that they have not been the light that God has called them to be. Now, who had God called them to be? In, in Micah 6, 8, God said to them, He called them to be a light to the other nations around them, to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. That's who God had called them to be. But what does Israel do? They do exactly the opposite. They completely ignore God's command. They live exactly the opposite of the way that they were called to live. They were called to be a light to the nations. And that's exactly the opposite of what Israel did. And they admit it in verses 5 through 7. They say, for we are not godly. We are, we are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? We are all infected and impure with sin. 
When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall. Our sins sweep us away like the wind. Yet no one calls on your name, verse 7, or pleads with you for mercy. Therefore, you have turned away from us and turned us over to our sins. In their confusion, in, in, in their confession, they, they realize that God is not to blame for their situation they find themselves in. Did you hear what I just said? God is not to blame for the situation that they find themselves in. They have a responsibility to own the choices and actions that they have gotten themselves in themselves. They've gotten themselves into this situation. But look at this. Even in their despair, they trust that God is still listening to them. They even say in verse 7, it isn't that you have stopped listening, it's that your people have stopped calling on your name. Nobody calls on your name anymore. Nobody calls for mercy and pleads for mercy anymore. Now they reach a point at the end of verse 7, between verses 7 and 8, and, and, and I don't know if most of you in your Bibles, there's a gap, a, a break that happens right there between verses 7 and 8. Right? That's them pausing. A lot of times it's good for us when we pray to just shut up and listen. So don't say anything. Just let our hearts be open before God. Let Him speak to you. They stop between verses 7 and 8. And the entire tone of their prayer changes. I want you to see this. This is incredible. I never saw this before. Their prayer completely switches. And in verse 8 they say, And yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all formed by your hand. The tone has totally changed. God is called Father and Potter, and they are the people and the clay that, that, that He forms them into being. And, and the circumstances have not changed. I want you to see that. They're still in this prayer moment. The circumstances around them have not changed. God has not all of a sudden started building up buildings and making everything, all the crops grow, and all of the, nothing's changed. They're still staring at a bleak wasteland that used to be their home. Not a thing has changed. They're still looking at this desolate place to call home. They still are without a temple. The temple had completely been destroyed. And everything they had was demolished. What changed? Their attitude and their view of their relationship to God in the middle of a hopeless situation. That's what changes. God is their father. They express their confidence in God who loves them in spite of their failings. God is the, their potter, molding them into who he wants them to be, making them look more and more like his people. And in verse 9 they say this, Don't be so angry with us, Lord. Please don't remember our sins forever. Look at us, we pray. And see that we are all your people. So what does this mean for us? As we are in our first week celebrating Christmas this season, it, things kind of seem off a little bit. There seems to be a sense of hopelessness all around us, hopeless situation in our nation. We have never been more at odds and divided in our country, or so they want us to think. Hopeless situation, it's the most hopeless as, as we are people we care about the suffering and the brokenness and the, the broken homes, the financial uncertainty of what's going to happen in the future in 2021. Maybe 2021 will be worse than 2020. I know for many people when they are in these hopeless situations, God feels distant from them. And we wonder why God doesn't do something. Remember their prayer. They said, tear open the heavens. And we look back. At, at, at the way that God has worked in the past. And we say, do it again, God, do it again. Maybe, maybe just, just maybe the answer to the hopeless feeling that we have, maybe the thing that will bring us hope is confession. Maybe, and I'm just throwing this out there, maybe it's the confession that we have that we have not lived godly lives. 
We have not trained our kids to live godly lives. We've not done what we were supposed to as, as followers of God to make our home a place where God rules and reigns. Maybe it's not God's fault. Maybe all the things that are happening that are bad in life are not God's fault. Maybe they're our fault. And maybe we would see that if we would just confess. But see, they didn't realize it until they began to confess what all that they had done. They didn't realize where they were until their confession began who they were. Confession causes us to check our hearts for ungodliness. That's why when the people of Israel did it, it caused them to recognize that the situation that they were in was not because God left them, but because they left God. Conf confession makes us remember who we are and who God is. That's the beauty of confession. You say, I'm not a sinner. I don't have anything to confess. I haven't done anything bad. Hey, you want to know something? I guarantee you, if, I, if, we set, if God was right here right now, none of us could stand before him as righteous. Not one. In fact, that's what Paul says in Romans. There's none righteous. Nobody. Confession, confession makes us remember who we are, the sinners that we are, and who God is. And it helps us align ourselves with God. Can we take a moment right now and just sit in silence before God and confess ourselves, our sins to Him? You say, I don't have any sins, I'm, I'm good. But sometimes we sin by not even standing up for what is right and standing up against evil and wrong in our nation. Those of us who stay silent when wrong is done by our leaders... Confessing that God is our Father. Sometimes that means discipline. If God is your Father, that means discipline. Me as a father, I understand that. I always thought my parents just did it to be mean to me. I'm not even going to look at them. Sometimes you think that God disciplines us because He doesn't love us, but in fact, Scripture tells us exactly the opposite. God disciplines those He loves. Confessing that God is our Father, it, 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 it helps us to be more disciplined. Confessing that God is the potter means that He will mold us into what He wants us to be. The true hope for the world, when Isaiah writes this, the true hope for the world is about 700 years to come. Isaiah doesn't know what he's writing when he's writing this. Tear open the heavens, that's exactly what God's going to do. God's going to tear open the heavens and send down a baby. And that baby's going to be the Savior of the world. It's 700 years from when he says this. God, tear open the heavens and come down. Now, we have a privilege because we are seeing it on this side of things. We, we, we have a deeper understanding and in looking into the story. And we know how it's going to turn out for Israel. But that doesn't mean we don't face our own hopeless situation today. Because sometimes in our hopeless situation, God has an answer coming. We just don't expect it in the way we want it to happen. We might have years ahead of us questioning the presence of God or why things are happening the way that they are. But I want to listen. I want you to hear this, this quote by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He wrote a great Christmas poem, which was later turned in and added to a song, in which he said this, and in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. We can feel that despair strongly in our text today, in, in Isaiah 64. But a lot of us feel it in our lives all the time. And yet there is hope. There is hope. Not because everything is going to work out the way we think it should, there is hope, not because everything is going to be wrapped up in the neatest little bow for our Christmas mornings, but there is hope because God still hears our cries. Just like God heard his people hundreds of years before Christ ever came, thousands of years before Christ ever came, there's a hope because God is a good father who loves us. 
There is hope because we are still God's people. So even today, weeks before Christmas, when we will celebrate the light of the world coming, when the earth will rejoice over the birth of Christ, it's in the midst of despair today that we can still cling to a hope because we know that the earth will receive her king. Can we sit for a moment in silence, bowing our heads right now? This is what, this is what I want us to do. I want every head bow and every eye closed. Search your heart. I want the Holy Spirit to do what he does best right now. Those that are watching online, I want you to sit for a moment with your eyes closed, your head bowed, just kind of silent. For God to search and for us to confess. This is the time for us to confess and say, God, this is where we have missed what we should be doing. We haven't taught our kids the right way. We haven't taught our grandkids what it looks like to be followers of you. Can we do some soul searching right now? Just for a few moments. Lord, today, as you have, we have heard in your word what the people in Isaiah's day began to confess their sins. Their sins as a nation, their sins as a people. There were many. And we can look back on them and we can say, oh, we, we know where they went. We, we, they went off track. They could look ahead and see us and say, man, how far they've gone off track. Because we have. And as much as we want to put the blame on our leaders and the people in our nation, it's us as a people that have put them there. It is us as a nation who have not taught our kids and our grandkids that God is the one and only. We've taught them that he's one of many. We've taught them that this earth is all there is to live for instead of teaching them that there is heaven to come, that there is hell that's there, and that it is not God that has left us, but it is us that have moved away from God. So today, Lord, I'm asking not that you would open up the heavens again. What I'm asking is that you would turn our hearts toward you again, that you would help us to confess the areas of our lives that we have walked away from you. Instead of blaming you for not being where we are, that we would confess in our hearts that we have stepped back and not been in our relationship with you have not been serious. That we have not made you the king of our households. That we have not made you the priority in our work lives. We've left our Christian lives at church and our, 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 our public lives in public. But that's not what you want from us. As our potter, you want to mold us into being what you want us to be. So we ask, Father, that you would be our God. That you would pull us back to yourselves and help us see what it's like and what we need to do as a nation. And if there's suffering that we have to go through because of our choices, then we can't blame you. Help us to uphold righteousness, justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. That is our prayer today. We come from a place where it feels right now in our world, in our nation especially, we are at a hopeless juncture. And what we need right now is the Almighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, to break through and do what you do best, and that is to send revival to our land, to our church, to our community, to our world, not just America, but our world is in a broken, dark, and desolate place. And without you, the light of the world we are going to continue to spiral into even more wickedness, 
further and further from you. But in, I'm settling it in my heart that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, I don't care what the government tells me to do or what world leaders tell me to do. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Whatever that means. Per persecution, hate, mockery. I would much rather stand with you than stand with this wicked world. I ask God that in each of our homes, every mom and every dad, every grandmother, every grandfather, that there would be something inside of our hearts that would cry out and say, God, forgive us for not putting you first and foremost in our lives and forgive us for not making you the priority in our homes. For allowing other things to take precedence over you. Forgive us. Because our only hope is that you are our God. And that you are coming back again to make things right. To establish a kingdom of justice. And it will never happen when we take control of things. It only happens when you do. We're like that little boy in the middle of the, the store. We can't see you, but you can see us. Help us to stay where we are in our relationship with you and trust that you are coming again because you are our only hope. We love you today, Jesus. It's in your powerful name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.